So um, I took the liberty um, to slightly change the title of the of the presentation in from microRNAs regulating cardiac disease to non-coding RNAs uh, regulating cardiac disease uh, because I feel so at, at ease and at home that I'm, I'm, um, I consider to uh, include some really extremely preliminary data from the lab, uh, completely unpublished, uh, that might interest you um, uh, into understanding more about the non-coding um, genome and, and how it can affect cardiac disease. So already for about 15 years, uh, we are interested in understanding how the adult heart, the adult myocardium, responds to several types of stress. Now, um, one of the things that uh, is characteristic of, of the human myocardium, as adults as we are here, uh, our hearts have a very low, if not completely absent, capacity to regenerate. So any stimulus, any stress that is evoked, uh, humoral stress or neurohumoral stress or even biochemical stresses, um, the heart typically responds by left ventricular hypertrophy. So that is a increase in the wall thickness um, of, of um, uh, the heart muscles. And uh, what is underlying is an increase in the cardiomyocyte size. So the, the main uh, cardiac muscle cells start to grow, but they don't grow by, by proliferating, by increasing in number, but they grow by simply growing without, uh, with the same number of, of uh, nuclei in, in almost. So left ventricular hypertrophy, so big, thick, heavy hearts. Um, and one could say, well, is, what is so bad about having a big heart? Eh? So you know, if in, in normal language, one would say a big heart is, is good because then you're generous. But in fact, um, you know, it's the opposite of, of the Arnold Schwarzenegger big, strong skeletal muscles. A big heart, by, per definition, is a weaker heart. You can ask any cardiac thoracic uh, surgeon, big hearts, are, are really uh, looked at upon as a, as a pathological symptom. Not only that, but it, it also, uh, it's a very early phase and it predisposes the heart, it predisposes the heart to more serious diseases. One of them is uh, lethal arrhythmias, uh, which can be cured by pacemakers, but many people still die on, on this planet due to lethal arrhythmias where the heart simply arrests and no longer has any pump function. Another disease which is far more serious and, and increasing numbers of, of people are starting to suffer from this is um, um, heart failure, where due to processes that we don't really completely understand, uh, the heart starts to weaken progressively and, and is not, no longer able to pump sufficient blood through the systemic uh, circulation. A normal human, as we are sitting here, is about five liters per minute. And in heart failure, end-stage heart failure patients, this can be up to half a liter per minute. So that really jeopardizes, you know, almost every single organ. Um, and you get an organ shutdown and, and a very, uh, it, it has a very nasty um, uh, progression also. We don't understand very well how we can combat heart failure, although the incidence and, and prevalence is increasing. Um, nearly no therapeutic um, windows are, 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 are available to really combat the left ventricular hypertrophy response, although we know this is the biggest risk factor in humans to develop heart failure. So it is counterintuitive. Um, there's a lot of money going to cancer research, but this might be one of the future big killers also in developing uh, countries. So we set out to understand what are the gene regulatory mechanisms of this very early phenomenon of left ventricular hypertrophy, cardiomyocyte hypertrophy. What, what are the signals? What can we learn about this? Now, it took almost the whole 90s, 1990s of, of the last, uh, the previous century to understand that there are signals at the surface of, of membranes, receptors that can signal into to cells, into also cardiomyocytes, and they can activate a, a whole plethora of um, kinases and phosphatases uh, where it can evoke uh, the typical growth response of the heart muscle cells. Now, one of those um, intercellular enzymes that uh, 
transduce signals from the outside into the internal uh, world of the heart muscle cells is a phosphatase that we started to work on in the beginning of uh, 2000. Um, and, and multiple uh, gene, uh, let's say, gain and loss of function uh, uh, studies have been done in mice to, to show that calcineurin, a phosphatase, is uh, truly required for, uh, is sufficient to drive, and is also required for the cardiomyocyte hypertrophy response. So what happens with calcineurin, it recognizes a family of transcription factors, latent transcription factors that are present in the cytoplasm of heart muscle cells. They're called nuclear factor of activated T cells. They're hyperphosphorylated. And once this phosphatase is activated, it can drive dephosphorylated NFETs to the nucleus and activate a gene program that we think is underlying heart failure. So all these years, we have always been um, uh, wondering what could be the kinase, the identity of the kinase, since everything in life is a balance. You, you send something to the nucleus, it needs to be rephosphorylated at a certain moment in time, and uh, uh, kinases should be doing this job. So it wasn't until we embarked upon a number of other studies that we really bumped into this, this um, identity of the kinase, but I wanted to start also uh, by introducing um, what, what truly is the function of these NFET molecules, these transcription factors, in driving pathological hypertrophy. So a talented uh, young postdoc uh, already eight years ago or something in our lab uh, Miriam Bourgeois, she took NFET knockouts and, and did a very simple study. And, and this study is also the basis of the remainder of this presentation. So what we do, we use uh, transverse aortic constriction. That means we, we put a ligature around the uh, transverse aorta that mimics a higher blood pressure as uh, encountered in humans. So what we typically do is, uh, these are the sham operated animals. We, we typically produce a 45 to 50 millimeters of additional mercury that the left ventricle now senses um, in order to pump blood outside into the systemic uh, system. And we always make sure uh, that the two uh, genotypes, uh, so the wild types or the NFET knockouts, have an identical uh, pressure gradient, as we call it. Yeah? So what we see then is uh, these are the two sham operated normal corresponding animals. These are the wild types, these are the NFET knockouts. If we um, subject animals, mice, to two months of pressure overload, we get a typical heart failure response. First an initial thickening of the walls, then gradually dilation, loss of contractility, and the animals really don't thrive. Uh, they have really big hearts, wild type hearts, and you can see progressively you have dilation on these M-mode echocardiography pictures, and these animals really don't feel that well. Typically, as a human clinical syndrome, heart failure. But if we subject NFET knockouts, so the only factor that is in the whole genome, or just one, um, uh, one gene we take out, a transcription factor downstream of calcineurin, we can blunt the growth response to a dramatic extent and m even counterintuitively, the heart functions much better. So then we uh, also recognized and, and asked the question, there are different forms of heart growth. Athletes, for example, um, also have, uh, uh, so now we are in the, in the phase of Tour de France. Uh, we have these super athletes that are cycling and, and believe it or not, but also their hearts are bigger. Uh, their hearts are also have more capacity to pump. So that's, there are, appears to be at roughly two different types of growth. Pathological growth with loss of function, of contractility, and physiological or uh, volu uh, voluntary exercise um, type of, of uh, hypertrophy that is beneficial and doesn't lead to ar ar arrhythmias or heart failure. So we simply wanted to ask the question, um, is this pathway, this dramatic pathway that can drive hearts to grow, is it now also involved in this second type of hypertrophy? And for this, we subjected animals to voluntary wheel exercise. Uh, we, we, we leave the, uh, the, uh, the running wheels in the cages, and the animals love this. They, they run about seven kilometers a night, roughly almost at night. 
that's something that I cannot do uh, every day. Um, so seven kilometers every day, wild types and NFRED knockouts are uh, roughly the same. And if this calcineurin NFED pathway is also involved in voluntary wheel exercise or exercise-induced physiological hypertrophy, the adaptation to exercise, uh, we should see a dramatic blunting of the cardiac hypertrophy response. And that's exactly what we did not see. So these are the two lazy, sedentary mouse hearts, uh, type of uh, the wild types and the knockouts. These are the animals that were, the wild type animals that were exercised for a month. You see a, a growth, not as big as the uh, hypertensive growth uh, that can be quantified uh, by heart rate, body rate ratios. And exactly the NFAT knockouts have just as big as hearts as the wild type. So apparently we have encountered upon a pathway that is selective for pathological hypertrophy and therefore of, of sincere interest to understand what are the downstream gene expression patterns and, and genes, um, what is the gene regulatory mechanisms that lead to heart failure. So it wasn't until a few years later that we also considered that um, in terms of genes, we should not only consider protein coding genes, but also the non-coding uh, genome. And, and um, our lab was one of the, uh, well, many who were starting to get interesting, uh, interested in microRNA biology and microRNA genes. And um, these two ladies, Paula da Costa Martins, a postdoc in our lab, and pa uh, Kanita Salic, a PhD student, together um, through a series of arrays encountered a microRNA as a downstream target of the pathway that I just described, calcineurin and fat signaling pathway. So consistently when calcineurin and fat signaling was active, they found this microRNA upregulated. You can see the complete hairpin over here, a precursor uh, molecule. Uh, microRNAs are just like normal genes. They are transcribed by RNA polymerase II. Uh, they're exported out of the nucleus as, as fairly large uh, precursors. And then in the um, cytoplasm, they can be diced up by dicer uh, into 22 nucleotide, 21 to 22 nucleotide single-stranded RNA molecules that can suppress uh, gene um, um, uh, protein translation of multiple proteins at the same time. So what is so unique about this uh, microRNA? Well, it's not heart specific, but it's remarkably enriched in the heart muscle, where we can also see traces in the kidney and in the brain. And it has a very high uh, conservation level, evol evolutionary conservation. So yes, indeed, uh, these are northern blots over here. Um, this micro microRNA is increased in hearts that have a artificial activation of calcineurin and fat signaling, and in the pressure overloaded uh, mouse hearts, we can also see an increase of this microRNA. And this is not a rodent phenomenon because we can see the same in northern blots of, of biopsies of uh, human heart failure samples. So non-failing hearts have less of this microRNA 199B versus the failing uh, human hearts. And at a certain moment in time, we were also interested, okay, so, so mechanistically, how is this microRNA now responsive to calcineurin and fat signaling? And um, so we screened the upstream region of, of uh, the microRNA gene. Here it is uh, at the, with this blue arrow. arrow. Uh, and we encountered um, a potential NFAT binding site. So NFAT is a transcription factor. They bind through consensus uh, sequences in the, in the uh, nucleus and the chromosomes. And, and we could identify a consensus binding size, roughly 3 kb upstream of the start site of this microRNA gene. More impressively, I still think, is that in NFAT knockouts, this microRNA is simply gone, uh, which in the end is, is a very strong uh, type of uh, indication that it must be NFAT dependent. But anyway, we also did luciferase assay. So from the, the whole region that we identified uh, a number of potential NFET sites, we, we cloned them and put them uh, in front of uh, a minimal promoter with uh, luciferase, driving luciferase, and then in transit transfection assays, we just addressed whether these constructs, these 1KB constructs, 
are sensitive to uh, NFAT uh, stimulus, hey, calcineurin NFAT stim stimuli. A number of them were, but there was one that is really um, uh, super sensitive to calcineurin NFAT signaling right at this, nuclear, uh, this N3 site. And if we mutate this site, we lose the, respons uh, the responsiveness to uh, calcineurin NFAT signaling. So this gave us very strong hints that this microRNA is a calcineurin NFAT uh, target gene. So what, what is it doing then? What, what could it be doing in the heart? Why is it enriched in the heart under pathological signals? Is this a cause? Is it a, an effect? Is it driving something? So to address this, we created transgenic mouse lines overexpressing a microRNA which in the heart, which at that time had, had not been done. Uh, so it was kind of scary, um, we, but we just tried it. We took the 5.5 uh, kb alpha-mycin heavy chain promoter, which is specific for the adult myocardium of the mouse, cloned behind it the uh, complete precursor, and um, followed by the polyadenylation site. And we indeed could find uh, three different transgenic lines, each expressing this microRNA at different levels, but always within roughly three to two to three-fold overexpression compared to the normal situation, which is similar to the human uh, situation in heart failure. A little bit disappointingly, the animals had no phenotype. The heart was completely the same as normal heart. So overexpressing microRNA 199B was not sufficient to cause a big heart. So what is it doing then? So what we did then is, is take hearts that have, uh, under the same promoter, an activated form of calcineurin. So now, artificially, we activate calcineurin and fat signaling. We get big hearts with thick walls um, and the, the beginning of heart failure. And if we crossbreed these two animals, now we get a cardiomegaly. So I've never seen bigger mouse hearts than this. This was about four to five times bigger. It's truly a whopping phenotype where it almost accelerated the whole phenotype uh, just by activating calcineurin and fat signaling. So this, this intrigued me. Why, why is this a sensitizer? Why, why is a small 22 nucleotide sequence able to activate and, and, and uh, sensitize the whole myocardium to pathological growth? What are its targets? And, and um, we searched databases. Um, we found, of course, multiple potential targets, and one of, uh, one of them really struck our, our, um, our eyes. It's a vague uh, kinase, dual specificity tyrosine phosphorylation regulated kinase 1A that has had uh, at that time only been described twice in a back-to-back -back papers from Gerald Crabtree and, and Jenna Rao using genome-wide uh, screens where they identified DIRK 1A, the potential microRNA 199B target gene, as um, an NFAT kinase. So this might be one of those nuclear localized kinases that are able to recognize NFATs, dephosphorylate them, dephosphorylated NFATs, rephosphorylate them and send them back to the cytoplasm. Uh, so these are just some pictures and, and this was then the working hypothesis that we had. So calcineurin NFAT signaling drives gene expression that is causing heart failure. One of those genes is microRNA 199B and in its turn, it might have dirk one a the kinase, the nuclear kinase, as a potential target. So a very direct, direct thing, Western blots, uh, hearts from um, uh, pathological um, um, calcineurin transgenic animals had greatly reduced dirk one a levels. The dirk one a 3' uh, UTR harbored a uh, uh, very sensitive and, and highly conserved potential microRNA binding site. We cloned this 3' UTA reporter up um, uh, downstream of Lecifrase to, to create these microRNA reporter assays. We could dose dependently decrease Lecifrase activity, and if we mutate it or we, we um, um, transfect in a completely irrelevant microRNA, we don't see any um, efficiency, any um, sensitivity to, uh, to this uh, effect. So we also wanted to see if this microRNA could be used in cell culture in more acute experiments. So these are neonatal rat cardiomyocytes with phenylephrine or endothelin uh, to classical prohypertrophic response um, uh, agonists. 
we could increase the amount of uh, microRNA 199B, and after 24 hours, we could already see a decrease of this endogenous DIRK1A kinase. Then we used an NFAT reporter assay, so we infected cardiomyocytes with an adenovirus overexpressing an NFAT GFP fusion. So normally, in quiescent cardiomyocytes, NFAT GFP is localized just as normal NFAT, um, NFAT molecules in the cytoplasm. If we give phenylephrine, you see the cells start to grow in, in, in red alpha actinin, uh, and in, in, in green, the, the, the nuclei. You can see that all these nuclei are now positive for NFAT GFP. So can microRNA 198B influence this phenotype? Yes, it does, and it does it very dramatically. So these are the control situation again. This is cytoplasmic um, NFAT GFP. And if we block microRNA 199B with an antimere, uh, we can completely abrogate the cardiomyocyte hypertrophy response, but also uh, the NFAT translocation. This is quantified here. So apparently, this microRNA was able to influence a kinase that in its turn influenced these um, uh, NFAT molecules. So to also address this in another way, we collaborated with, um, um, uh, with a um, uh, scientist in Barcelona who created DIRK1A knockouts. Now the full knockout is embryonic lethal, so we could not use these, but the haploinsufficient, so the heterozygote animals we could use. The, 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 uh, they have about 50% uh, of the DIRK1A expression levels in the heart. They're indistinguishable from normal uh, mice, uh, no serious red, so no fibrotic uh, lesions. But if we stimulate these hearts to grow with uh, pressure overload, the TAC surgery, head transverse aortic constriction surgery, for only two weeks you get the growth of the heart in, in the normal animals and in the haploinsufficient mice you get um, uh, cardiomegaly again. So an, an ab absurd growth of the pathological uh, hypertrophy response. So just to be sure that DIRK1A and microRNAs that are really not a rodent phenomenon only, we took biopsies of non-failing human myocardium and failing human myocardium of different types of etiology, ischemic cardiomyopathy or dilated cardiomyopathy. We quantified the copy numbers of microRNAs, we quantified the amount of DIRK1A, you get a beautiful inverse correlation. So the higher the numbers of microRNA in one single biopsy of a human my, uh, myocardium, the lower the amount of uh, the DIRK1A. So what we did then, finally, is to intervene directly in microRNA expression in vivo by silencing. So what we did is we, we generated by chemistry a antisense, antimere microRNA, an anti-microRNA molecule, so that's 22 nucleotides that fit perfectly to the endogenous microRNA, chemically modified so that uh, we improve the pharmacokinetics and dynamics um, and uh, make it also resistant to um, uh, nucleases. So this is about, um, this is what they call an antagomere, yes? So a specific antagomere against microRNA 199B. We injected these in the calcineurin transgenic animals, and here you can see the, the regimen, so um, young animals still, two weeks old, we gave them antagomere for three consecutive days injection, and we looked at the animals a week later. Just very quick experiment. So these are the, uh, this is a northern blot again, this is the wild type level of the microRNA in myocardium. You can see the increase in the calcium and transgenic hearts, and with the antagomere treatment, you can nearly completely silence uh, this microRNA, endogenous silencing in the heart. Um, so this is specific, this is microRNA 199A, because it doesn't touch a highly related microRNA 199A, but it does ha harbor a few nucleotide differences. So it's a very specific method also. When we injected the animals and then sacrificed them and looked a week later, I could hardly believe what I saw. So this is the control situation. This is the calcineurin transgenic heart with roughly a threefold increase in heart size. And here, the antagomere treated animals, which are com nearly completely normalized. What was also interesting is that the amount of DIRK1A was now restored, eh? derepression of this um, target gene DIRK1A. 
So this is still a artificial model. It's a Kelsen transgenic model. So it's artificial overexpression of a molecule, which may not have much to do with normal life. So we did the same now in, in hypertensive mice, eh, mice with, that harbor the surgery, transverse aortic constriction, and uh, repeated the same strategy. We gave the animals um, uh, antagomir for three days, uh, and after three weeks we repeated so that we, uh, we were sure that we, we had sufficient silencing um, and, and harvested the animals as, after six weeks of, of uh, uh, surgery. These are the control animals after six weeks, large hearts, myofiber disarray, and fibrotic lesions, so the hearts are not happy. Um, and here are the antagomir treated animals. They maintain very small, uh, small hearts, DIRK one a levels are completely derepressed, and all these fetal genes, ANF, BMP, which is also the clinical diagnostic marker for heart failure in humans, BMP, um, betamycin, heavy chain, alpha skeletal actin, all of them were su sufficiently repressed. Impressively, also function, cardiac function, was um, very much improved. So smaller hearts, better contractility. Here are the controls again. Um, you can see a progressive dilation and, and less contractility of the heart in vehicle-treated animals. Um, and if we give an antagomere, in each case, you can see that the heart functions better. Here is its quantified fractional shortening, which is roughly the same as ejection fraction. You can see this dramatic decrease after six weeks of trans transverse aortic constriction with the antagomere is normalized. Dilation, normalized. This is a factor or, or, or a parameter for diastolic dysfunction, so the relaxation force of the heart, which is also normalized. Um, um, sorry, this is VCF, this is systolic function and diastolic function. So then we did something um, a little bit more tricky, uh, and we haven't repeated this anymore because these, these studies are somewhat expensive. We said, could this ever be a therapy? And if it's a therapy, you would not go preventive to get a drug before you get a disease, yeah? So you, you don't go to your doctor and say, well, I, I think tomorrow I will develop a big heart. Can you give me something to prevent this big heart because then it will protect me against heart failure? No, normally you go to your physician if you have clinical syndromes, so, so you have um, uh, tiredness and you have the disease. So any drug that new drugs for heart failure should be strong enough to actually reverse the disease also to a certain extent. So this is how we did this. We, we, we tested uh, the reversibility of heart failure, which had not been shown before, the reversibility of heart failure by inducing the disease for three weeks, and for three weeks in a mouse that's fairly long, you get a sick looking heart, and then we gave the antagomere, and follow the animals for another three weeks. So these are the uh, control situations again. So these are the sham operated, the healthy animals, normal looking hearts. Um, these are the animals that after three weeks received vehicle, so PBS, yeah? control situation, placebo. You can see the hearts are really not happy at six weeks. And if we give the antagomere, we get an almost complete normalization. So. These antagomeres are, so the, the anti-sense silencing of this microRNA is so potent that it can actually reverse um, uh, advanced phases of, of uh, heart failure. So this is then the, the picture that we depicted uh, before I switch to uh, gears and go to another one. What we've shown so far was that calcium and fat signaling, this is a phosphatase sensitive to calcium care modulin signaling recognizes NFET molecules in the cytoplasm, can drive them to the nucleus, activate gene expression profiles that we think are intimately um, associated with cardiac remodeling and heart failure. One of those tiny target genes of NFETs is a microRNA gene hidden in the genome, which slowly starts to um, decrease the amount of a nuclear kinase that is designed to drive NFETs back to the nucleus. So this is the bad player, and this is the, um, uh, if you want, the good, the good cop. And so very cunningly, 
and fat molecules, and this, this whole si uh, system has developed some sort of fort feed, feed forward loop, an, an, an activating loop inside so that you get in, in, um, um, insurance of nuclear and fats um, in, in heart muscle cells. Now luckily we can uh, repress this, this feed forward loop by intervening in the expression of, of this uh, microRNA gene using an antagomer uh, against 199B. Now, we switch gears and go to, um, um, to another part of, of a project which is completely unpublished, and they also have to do with uh, transcription factors. So now, we know that in our genome we have about 1,400 transcription factors, and only very few transcription factors have been uh, annotated to be functional in adult heart disease. And, and to understand a few of these factors, it's always good to look at cardiogenesis. So this is embryonic development of the heart, where you have these combinatorial interplay between different transcription factors um, that drive different phases of uh, heart muscle development in mammalian species. So for example, the transcription factors like uh, TBX5 or NK2.5 uh, together with HAND1 and Iroquois um, are able to um, activate the future uh, first heart field and future left ventricle. And likewise, you have transcription factors like HAND2, MEF2C, and GATA4 that drive the secondary heart field, which becomes the right ventricle and the outflow tract. You have specific transcription factors that drive atrial expression or atrial uh, differentiation uh, transcription factors that lead to aortic valve formation and even those that lead to um, conduction system uh, act activation. So some, but certainly not all of these embryonic transcription factors are reactivated in the adult heart upon uh, heart failure in the um, human. So this one I already explained, Kelsner and Fat Singley. You have another one, very classical, MEF2 that is uh, under signal responsive um, uh, sensitivity by HDEX, histone deacetylases, and its uh, activator CAMTA. You have GATA4, SRF, and NK, NF-kappa-B that all have been somehow associated with cardiac hypertrophy response, uh, the pathological hypertrophy response uh, at the initiation of heart failure. So it is truly unbelievable that we only can identify, or we have identified, after decades of work, work, only seven transcription factors that um, seem to play a role in this very serious and complicated disease. So there must be other transcription factors also associated with this. And the identification of transcription factors that function both in embryonic heart development and in adult heart disease might also give us a new insight in how fetal gene reactivation, which we always see in the adult failing heart, how that mechanistically can be explained. So a few years ago, uh, these two ladies um, uh, identified one of those embryonic transcription factors, HAN2, heart and neurocrest derivatives 2, and it seemed to be re-expressed in the failing heart. So this is Ellen Dirks, who is uh, for two months here in, uh, in this institute, and Paula da Costa Marcus again. So what, what is HAN2? It is a transcription factor of the basic helix loop helix uh, transcription superfamily, transcri superfamily of transcription factors. And it can homodimerize or heterodimerize and, and really activate uh, the secondary heart field. Uh, so you have basic helix loop helix transcription factors like NeuroD that actually set down and, and uh, activate the brain in the uh, developing embryo. In the same way, for the pancreas, and HAN2 is one of those that activate cardiogenesis. So it's, it's overexpressed at the um, protein level in rodents. It's overexpressed in different uh, um, um, failing hearts of uh, human biopsies, eh? so the humans. So this is, again, something that happens also in humans, in the failing heart. Again, we went to look for how it is activated. Since we saw it activated in Kelsner and NFAT signals, uh, signaling uh, context, we screened again the upstream promoter of HAN2, and now 7KB upstream we found a potential NFET binding sites, 
We tested this again using uh, NFET reporter luciferase assays. If you mutate this N4 re reporter, only a few nucleotides, two nucleotides, it fully uh, loses again the sensitivity to uh, calcium and NFET signaling. And we could uh, uh, also show it by chromatin immunoprecipitation. So apparently, HAN2 is under transcriptional regulation of calcium and NFET signaling. But we know by now that proteins can also be controlled by microRNAs. I just gave you a very good example of microRNA 199B, how it regulates DIRK1A. So at a certain moment in time, we also address the question, are there microRNAs that are repressed in expression in the failing heart and thereby derepress HAN2? Could that be operative? And there was one microRNA who did that. It was microRNA 25. It's part of a cluster, 106 to 25. And it harbored a remarkably conserved um, um, uh, seed site to the 3' UTR of HAN2, not only in humans, but all the way back to mice uh, with intermediates as dogs and rabbits. So this is very conserved. Reporter assays, um, I'm sorry for the bad resolution. Um, so, reporter assays are uh, sensitive to microRNA 25 expression, and if we mutate the site, the seed site, it loses the sensitivity. We could also show that manipulating microRNA 25 expression in sculptured cells could influence um, the cardiomyocyte growth potential uh, by phenylephrin. So these are the control situation. This is normal heart muscle cells in red stained for alpha actinin, in blue for DAPI. You can see the typical growth response of cardiomyocytes uh, with phenylephrine. But if we prevent the down regulation of 25, microRNA 25, by overexpressing a precursor for 25, we can nearly completely abrogate this response. So what I've told you so far is that we somehow stumbled upon a new downstream target of calcium and fat signaling. Um, and it's a transcription factor that is known to be involved in embryonic heart development. It's called HAN2. It's under positive control by NFET molecules, transcriptional control. And we think that the downregulation of this microRNA also facilitates uh, that derepresses the expression of HAN2. So it's, it's both uh, transcriptional activation and microRNA-mediated derepression. So what does HAN2 do in the adult heart? To mimic this, we generated transgenic mice, transgenic lines under control again of the alpha mice in heavy chain promoter. So we cloned human HAN2 under control of this promoter, generated several transgenic lines. And here you can see, depending on the overexpression level, you get a dose-dependent increase in heart size. Um, so that is overexpression. So that says that it's sufficient to drive a pathological heart failure response. But what happens if we take out HAN2? So for this, we did a little bit more complicated scheme. We took, we collaborated with uh, Peter Caesar G in New Orleans, who created floxed allele HAN2 mice. Yeah? So these mice are now sensitive to CREELOX dependent uh, knockout or, or gene silencing uh, or gene knockout uh, technology. And we crossbred them with uh, alpha mice in heavy chain, heavy chain driven mercury mer mice, which are CRE mice on the, uh, that are sensitive to, to tamoxifen. So if we inject animals now to tamoxifen, so double compound transgenic animals, they are, we can uh, silence HAN2 in the adult myocardium and only in heart muscle cells. And this is what we did. These are the control animals, HAN2, floxed animals, wild types, alpha mice in heavy chain, mercury, mer, HAN2, FF mice. Uh, both are normal, yes. All receive tamoxifen, of course. Uh, both are normal. These are the controls. These are animals, subjected wild type animals, the HAN2 floxed allele to uh, four weeks of transverse aortic constriction. You can see the uh, biventricular enlargement of the heart, typical for heart failure, fibrosis, disarray, big cross-sectional area of the heart muscle cells. So this is pathological hypertrophy. And if we silence HAN2 downstream of calcium and fat signaling, downstream of pressure overload, we get a dramatic 
repression of um, uh, the growth response, an improvement of fractional shortening, and, and less dilation. So taking out HEN2 is beneficial in the context of heart failure. We also looked at the target genes because HEN2 is a transcription factor itself. We looked at the target genes to see if we can get new clues of what uh, could be uh, driving downstream of HEN2. We find genes that have been um, identified before or, or designated before in the context of hypertrophine dilation. Uh, but we see also different, completely unrelated genes that might open the field to new ideas, um, something like ABC reporters or excellent guidance, slit robo, uh, these type of, of uh, pathways that we have never heard of. We, of course, validated many of these target genes by chromatin amino precipitation and, um, uh, assays and by luciferase assays. And then, finally, we also looked at whether silencing of microRNA25, as it occurs normally, if we manipulate microRNA25 expression in vivo, can also influence HEN2 expression or um, uh, the heart failure response. So what we did now is, is roughly the same again. We gave uh, transverse aortic constriction or sham operation <coughs> surgery. Uh, then we gave uh, antagomere specific for 25 to silence microRNA25 in vivo and look four weeks later, and what we saw is that the hearts were more sensitive to uh, the heart failure response, not dramatically different, but if we, if we can say anything, it was more sensitized, slightly more dilation, slightly thinner walls, but most remarkably already in the sham operated animals without surgery, we started to see dilation. So repressing microRNA25 is sufficient to start the uh, processes of, of um, heart muscle cell um, um, remodeling, cardiac remodeling and dilation. So to really prove that this is a hand to dependent effect, and this is getting a little bit more complex, but what we did here is just injecting microRNA25 and tagomere to produce this uh, uh, spontaneous dilatative response, uh, as you can see here, fraction shortening and ejection fraction and uh, uh, left ventricular internal diameter for four weeks. But we repeated the same also in HEN2 knockouts to see if HEN2 is the responsive downstream target of this microRNA. And if we knock out uh, HEN2 in the red bars, um, no, sorry, here, uh, you can get a near normalization of this effect. So. What we think what is happening is, is the following, that Gelsner and NFAT signals are, are sensitive to biomechanical stress or neurohumoral factors um, driving pathological hypertrophy. One of it, it, it activates multiple genes. Uh, one of them is microRNA199b, um, which creates a feed-forward loop. Another one is an, an embryonic transcription factor called HEN2. Um, and in conjunction with a downregulation of microRNA25, which we now also think is downstream of calcium and NFAT signals, so re repressed, it activates um, the expression, the reactivation of a transcription factor normally only activated in the uh, fetal heart. And in its turn, HEN2 is able to activate a number of remodeling genes that can participate in heart failure. Now, and if time permits, I would like to show four more slides with completely new data. Um, I've never presented the data anywhere else, um, and I think we are one of the first in the world to show this. So what I've shown you so far is that we now know that RNA is not only the classical messenger RNAs and protein coding RNAs, we also have non-coding RNAs, and non-coding RNA might be much more bigger and more involved in many of the pathways and biology that we, uh, that we study. One of them is our microRNAs. I gave you two examples of microRNAs, but I did not give you an example of long non-coding RNAs, link RNAs. So link RNAs are larger non-coding RNA transcripts, 200 nucleotides at least, all the way up to few KBs. Their functions are much more vague. They are just recently developed, or uh, discovered, and we think that they can influence signaling, they can act as decoys, they can do things with 
chromatin modification. And so just as first steps, we, we analyzed whether link RNAs are expressed, one, are they expressed in the heart? And two, are they differentially expressed after, um, in, in a diseased heart? So Virginie Kine, a postdoc who started about two years ago in our lab, just did this assay. She took two of our mouse models with dramatic heart failure, calcineurin transgenics or transverse aortic constriction, and she just subjected the RNA to arrays to, def to detect whether there are differentially expressed link RNAs, and yes, there are. To my surprise, many are differentially expressed. Uh, these are all log two ratios. So uh, these are volcano plots. On, on this, on the, the x-axis, you see the fall change. So more expressed or less expressed. And these are the uh, log 10 p-values. So the probability that uh, the differences are truly uh, statistically significant. And we can see Micro, uh, link RNAs that are dramatically and very statistically significantly uh, repressed or activated in the adult myocardium. Um, so many of these genes were um, unknown. They don't have a name, uh, just a number. Uh, the transcripts are known in the genome. Uh, and so it was our task to um, name uh, the, the these transcripts. It's RNA molecules that have no, just a number and no name. And um, the ones that went activated, we call them nachos um, for uh, one of the foods that I kind of like. And the ones that are decreased, we call them Nordic. Yeah? So the, low, the more up you go in the north, the colder it gets. Yeah, So cold is repressed. Anyway, uh, nachos and Nordics. Link RNAs that are activated and decreased in pathological hypertrophy. And here you can see the whole list of, of uh, differentially expressed. Mm -hmm. These are three transgenic hearts, three transverse aortic constricted hearts, and three wild types. So you can see Im immediately by this heat map, some of these uh, link RNAs are low expressed in the healthy heart and get reactivated in the uh, failing heart. Some are highly expressed in the healthy heart and get derepressed, yeah, get decreased. We could easily detect certain link RNAs, nachos, that are 100 folds overexpressed in the heart. So why would you overexpress a link RNA for 100 folds? That, that to me was really whopping. You never see this with microRNAs. So we designed, and every single thing here, there are no tools available um, uh, commercially, so we have to develop all these tools ourselves we um, develop qPCR primers that are specific for link RNAs that don't pick up anything else. And we could really show in these different animal models that they are indeed uh, valid, validatable. Um, and, and most, and this is my last um, slide that I will show of, of data, most remarkably, they are functionally involved in cardiomyocyte hypertrophy. So we designed siRNAs that are specifically short hairpins, specifically designed to um, decrease, to repress, to, to silence link RNAs, nachos, or Nordics. Uh, and and uh, sorry for the bad resolution again. This is the control situation. Uh, you see the small cardiomyocytes, here phenylephrine, the cardiomyocyte hypertrophy. Scrambled siRNA, you can see when we silence these um, uh, nachos, we can see a quite remarkable repression of, uh, for all these individual link RNAs, um, repression of cardiomyocyte hypertrophy. And sometimes with the Nordics, the ones that go down, if we silence them, it is even sufficient, um, uh, the silencing of one link RNA to provoke spontaneous uh, cardiomyocyte hypertrophy. So this gives me, um, uh, comes, uh, brings me back to, to maybe the final slide where we went from normal classical signaling, cellular signaling, and got intrigued by non-coding RNA biology through microRNAs, and now expand our research into link RNAs, and we think it, it's an intimate link between these non-coding RNA transcripts and classical signaling molecules and transcription factors that will, that drives uh, pathological uh, diseases of the heart. 
Now, just to um, say thanks to the, the people who really did the work. It's, I mentioned her a, a few times already. Whoa. That this is part of the Costa Martins, uh, Virginie Kiné, who worked on the link RNA projects, Miriam Bourges on the NFET knockouts, Ellen Dirks, who works on the uh, HAND2, the, the microRNA25 story. I need to uh, thank also a number of people who helped us with, with models, uh, Peter Cesar for the HAND2 flux allele animal, Thomas Eschenhagen for the human biopsies, Thomas Toom, who provided us also with fetal human heart material, material, uh, Stephanie Dimmler for a number of, of uh, reagents, Stefan Heimans from our department um, for sharing uh, technologies, and Monica Stoll and Frank Rulle from Münster for the bioinformatics help on the link RNA projects, and a series of funders that, that make our work uh, possible in the Netherlands. Thank you for your attention, and uh, I'm more than welcome to um, uh, take any questions. Thank you.